vital in our existence, in our ability to uh, communicate with one another, and to uh, be productive in life. And yet, it is completely unnatural. We are hardwired and born with all the mechanisms necessary for speech and language. All a human has to do is be exposed to a mother language, and they're going to learn it. But with reading, it has to be taught, it has to be learned. And there are certain building blocks to that language system that I'll go over with in a little bit. All right, oh, it works, isn't that wonderful? Melody's on our side. Okay, what are reading disorders? In a nutshell, reading disorders occur when a person has trouble with any part of the reading process. It's present from a young age, usually born with it, usually results from specific differences in how the brain processes language. It's not a sign of intelligence or developmental lags or unwillingness to learn. As a teacher, we often wait to see if these developmental lags are going to change because there are developmental lags, and sometimes it takes a couple years for them to pull all that together. However, a true learning disability is not a part of the developmental lag. So that one can be eliminated. And of course, not an unwillingness to learn. Everybody wants to learn. Every child wants to learn. Everybody loves to feel smart. You feel smart when you know things. You feel confident to go at it again. Okay, types of learning disabilities. There are different types of learning disabilities. There's language disabilities, there's reading disabilities, there's writing disabilities, there are spelling disabilities, and there are numbers disabilities. And I'll go over some names of those in just a minute or any combination of these. I can say that as a classroom teacher and even as a tutor, I very seldom ever see one of these issues giving people trouble. Once in a while numbers, dyscalculia, but um, almost always there's a combination going on. And it's not so important that we're able to split those, the, those hairs as it is what do we do when we have people with this, with this group or with people that are having language or reading issues. Okay, how learning disabilities affect a person's life in just about every way imaginable. How a person reads, writes, speaks, and calculates can also affect higher level skills such as their organization and planning. This is where executive functions come in. Abstract reasoning, long and short term memory, and their attention span. It impact, or it, the impact of learning disabilities touches relationships, families, friends, and with adults, of course, in the workplace. Causes of learning disabilities. Three main causes. Genetics. Usually with a dyslexic, you're going to find somebody in the family that had trouble learning to read. Whether or not they knew or were aware that it was dyslexia, many times in the past years they did not. They just know, you know, I think I had, I even had parents say to me, you know, I think I had trouble reading. And sometimes I'll have a dad say, you know, I was dyslexic. Maybe he went further and even as an adult was evaluated and found out that he was dyslexic. But genetics has a big part to play in any learning disabilities, particularly dyslexia. <clears throat> Neurological disorders, it's just the way they're hardwired during the fetal stages or trauma to the brain. Okay, types of learning disabilities. Auditory processing disorder. These are the little buggers that can't remember what you say. They have trouble following directions. They, have, um, they may have issues with um, understanding humor. very closely related to language processing disorders. Sometimes you're going to see people say that an auditory processing disorder and language processing disorder are one and the same. Again, you're really kind of splitting hairs there. They are different, they are different. But in this one more, in language processing disorder, is how they form the words. They know what they want to say. They know it has meaning in their brain, but they can't get the words out of their mouth. That connection or disconnection, that wiring, has been disrupted at some point in time. Discalcula, thinking of the word calcula and calculus reminds you of math. That's all about numbers. These people have trouble learning rote math facts, understanding um, mathematical properties, multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. They have trouble reading the time or knowing the time, being able to tell the time on a clock, uh, keeping a calendar, older people being able to even keep a planner. I had um, one person call me and ask me if I could tutor their uh, adult daughter who was in college who couldn't follow a calendar, couldn't read a clock, didn't know how to get herself up and didn't understand what those numbers meant, just had no meaning to her at all. 
was the only student I've ever trained on because I knew I wasn't the right therapist for them. They needed somebody that particularly was trained in this area. Uh, dyspraxia, that's muscle movement, clumsiness. Um, that might be an inability even to, um, to oh, I'm sorry, dysgraphia. I skipped dysgraphia. Graphia, graphics, okay. Those kids have trouble forming letters, getting them down on lines, spatial relationships, sometimes trouble working puzzles as well. And then the dyspraxia is the muscle coordination button down here, where, they have, where they're clumsy and uh, have trouble judging spatial in their move with their own body as they move through space. If you see kids come to the library, they're always bumping into things and knocking things over. And they exhibit other issues with reading issues. It's very possible that they have some dyspraxia going on. And then, of course, my dyslexia that we're going to talk about in just a bit of, in a minute in depth or a little bit more elaboration. Uh, dyslexia is a particular language disorder that affects reading and writing. Reading uh, and spelling. Let's see, visual perceptual motor de deficit. These kids also will reverse letters are confused when an M looks like a W. They can't seem to get it straight that an M and a W are different. Uh, B's and, and, and D's and P's and Q's. And I'm sure you've all heard of the bed concept. There's a lot of graphics out there and, and nice things on the internet that I have printed out for kids to teach them the difference between a B and a D. But I usually have them. Some people will like this, okay, with kids to make a bed. I usually have them put their fists together because I know how important multi-sensory instruction is with dyslexics, and the more they can feel, the more they can bang, the better imprint it's making in the brain. So I have them put their fists together like this and put their thumbs up. And then I have a picture on my board of a bed with a little teddy bear at the head of the bed, and it says B, E, D, and I said, that's right, you know, this and that all together. And they pretty much know B, E, D, and I said, you're good, let's sing the alphabet. A, B, C, D, oh, and then they look down, they see that this is the B, because this is the one, this is the tail that matches the tail on a B. Now, when I was teaching first grade, I, I haven't heard anybody else say this or, or, or report this to me. I'm sure it's got to be known by people outside of me. But one time it went like this, and I thought, oh my gosh, kids, dump your bed upside down. And they'll, I said, there's the P and the Q. So we have the same concept with which side the tail falls on, a P or a Q. For dyslexics, to an N and an H look very similar. So, you know, if you're making it, and I'll, again, I'm getting ahead of myself, but if you're doing posters for the library and you're handwriting them, or you're having them typed in some way, you can adjust that print. Having a longer neck on a D, a longer neck on an F, a longer neck on a T will help any child with dyslexia. Oh, nonverbal LDs. Nonverbal learning disabilities. Those are kids who have a high vocabulary, beautiful, can't walk confidently, seem to be skilled in just about all areas of school and all areas of life, except they cannot read facial expressions or body language. So if you're going like this as a mom, you're going like this, how many times have I told you? Your child might be thinking, she's trying to dance? You know, they just don't get those body expressions. They don't get disappointment, they don't get joy. So, Nonverbal LDs also impact with all of these impact all of life. Okay, related disorders. Related disorders are ADHD, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder. I have a lot of kids in the classroom that I was teaching that had physical overflow, but I would not call them ADHD. They're just very active children. And I never label a child unless they have been diagnosed by a neuropsychologist who went through a battery of tests to have an ADHD. I understand that kids are active. I was an active one. ADD, that's attention deficit disorder. Much different than ADHD in that it lacks the activity level. You have these kids that are reading, or they're, uh, you might be reading to them in a group. And I remember one little girl that would just sort of check out. She just filled this off. I have one student now who's dyslexic and ADD. So he'll be reading to me very, very bright. This kid is so much brighter than I will ever be, and he just doesn't know it. But he's a very great kid, but very, very dyslexic, and he has ADD. But he knows himself, and he knows himself as a learner. He's just uh, starting fifth grade now. And he'll say, 
I'll see him looking, and I know where his mind is going because he's so bright. He's asking himself all kinds of questions about the principle that I'm teaching him at, at that moment, and or something that he's read. And he's got, but he's what I, what I would call in school we say we rabbit trail off. He's rabbit trailing off, and all of a sudden, oh, excuse me, Miss Amaria, and I just checked out for a minute. So that also impacts learning. And then executive functions, how you plan, how you initiate, how you manage your materials. One of the first things that I would teach any middle schooler that comes to me with one of those book bags that look like, the, like a tornado went through it, is I teach them how to manage their materials and have a regular system for teaching them that. Once their materials are managed, then they can manage their time, but you cannot manage time before materials are managed. Okay, these are not considered learning disabilities per se. 30 to 50 percent of these people also have learning disabilities, which makes learning very difficult. Just like the little boy that I mentioned that has ADD and is also very dyslexic. <laughs> and you know, if anybody has a question, shoot your arm up. I know that well, we're going we're gonna to make time. We're going to be within, I think, uh, time. But you know, if you have a burning question, you jot it down, which is one of the one of the um, the cues that I give kids when I'm teaching them executive functions is keep sticky notes by the time and write down what you want to ask a teacher because by tomorrow you'll forget, or even maybe by the end of this chapter you might forget what you wanted to ask. So jot things down, always carry sticky notes or some kind of paper that you can jot down. Okay, red flags for reading disorders. Some of these are also, many of them are the trip over dyslexia, but in general, for any of the reading disorders that I just spoke of, an inability to associate letters with sounds. That's number one with dyslexia. Failure to understand that words come apart they come apart. They're, they're, they're made of those segmented pieces. When, uh, I'm not going to go there, I'll talk about that in just a moment. Reading errors that show no connection to sound at all. Inability to read common one-syllable words, the CDC words, the consonant, vowel, consonant words. They cannot segment those sounds. Inability, I, I'm sorry, influence speech, not being able to find the right word. They might want to say tornado, but it comes all volcano. Very common in dyslexia. Vague references. They use stuff as opposed to the proper word because they need to get their ideas out and forming that language, getting that language out, forming those ideas. Those neurological pathways to the brain are wired differently or have been disrupted, and they just can't get out what they want to say, but they're just anxious to get the meaning to you, what they're thinking in their mind. And so they're going to supply other words. Stuff, you know. A lot of them, you know. Doesn't it drive you nuts when you see kids on TV, like a teenager, and you know is, the, is every third or fourth word? I want to say, oh no, but there's more vocabulary. You know you've got it up there. We can help get that out. Okay, trouble reading unknown words. They just, again, don't have the phonetic principles to unlock the mystery of what an unknown word is to them. Red flags from reading source continued. Mispronunciation of long, unfamiliar words. Choppy reading, disastrous spelling, and handwriting as well. Uh, the same little boy that I told you is in the seventh grade now that was told to drop the reading tutor, he still cannot get letters down on paper. That's a very difficult process for him. And he will still say, Miss Amory, what, is, what does that R look like again? What's it look like? And if he does say, oh wait, I remember, it might be a reversal of a lowercase R. He just can't do that. Yes? Is typing help? Pardon me? Is typing help instead of writing? Absolutely. Typing does help. We'll get into that. Absolutely. Typing helps. And knowing what your what your rights are and what kind of accommodations can be made in school. What kind of advocacy can be made. Uh, on our sheet, I'll mention it now because I think it's so important. Parents need to know what kind of accommodations their child is entitled to if they have an IEP or a 504 plan. And one of them, uh, or one of the services that we provide at North Shore is an advocate, Sherry Missouri. And parents don't need to pay for this forever. She usually gets things in place, goes into the school, makes sure that children have what they need. Now, Sherry wasn't a part of this child's answer, but the mom was such an advocate for her child that she has now, and this is in my school district right around here, right in North Shore, this particular boy, this year, because of all the note-taking, in school has a scribe. He actually has somebody that comes in for certain classes where there's a lot of note taking, and that scribe will, will write all those notes for that boy. So I thought, oh my goodness, never thought about a scribe. I mean, here's me. 
see it was new information to me too, but I'm sure that Sherry knows this. And so even connecting parents, giving parents, I have my cards in the back, but there's also a sheet that lists our services, letting them know you know there's an advocate. You don't have to sign up, you don't have to start paying money, just call the office and talk this with and see if her services might be something that would match your needs. Uh, okay. Difficulty in remembering isolated pieces of information, rote memory, that's math facts, lists of words, lists of names are very difficult for kids with reading disorders. Slow progress as opposed to peers of the same age and the same intelligence. One of the biggest clues to a teacher and cues should be to a parent too is, well, is my child within the range? There's a wide range of what we call acceptable behaviors and acceptable uh, progress in a classroom. And if it's indicated to you that your child is not reading or not calculating with their peer group, and you know your child is probably just as bright as any of the other ones, you value reading at home, and your child is, is intrinsically motivated to learn like any other child, then you should probably look into the fact that you should have your child evaluated. Talk to teachers, but then have them evaluated. That's probably one of the, um, that's one of the stigmas that came with um, with learning to read. We've all assumed that you know, children are intrinsically, mo intrinsically motivated and they come from a family where, where reading and language and literacy is valued, then they're going to learn to read automatically. And that's not an automatic response. Everybody has to learn to read. Language is automatic, but reading is not. So this is a big one for the kids. They complain about how hard reading is and they have a tremendous fear of reading aloud. Round robin reading, you can see sweat beads almost forming on the, on, the, on the eyebrows or on the foreheads of some of the kids in those classes that I visited and even taught in. We stopped round robin reading quite a while ago. But still, even if you were to call on a student that where you were not doing round robin reading, they would have a fear of reading aloud. And they have a reading disability, particularly dyslexics. There, uh, there are great programs where you, where you pair older kids with younger kids to read in the schools. Most schools have those going on, and some of them do it with dyslexic kids too, but that dyslexic reader needs a lot of practice. And depending on the severity of, dys of the dyslexia, because there's all different levels of severity of all these learning disabilities and all different kinds of mixed bags, depending on the student, they may never be able to, no matter how many times they practice a simple word or a simple book like one of the Seuss books, Hop on Pop, by the time they get there, they may be under so much stress because they have to read to a kindergarten class that they're tripping over all the, and the kindergartners are helping them read. I know one boy that that happened to, that's why I chose that book. Um, okay, for comprehension. They absolutely don't know what they read because they're trying to pick up sounds and put them back down on paper and there's no flow to the reading. History of family reading problems. Big, big one right here. I rarely ever, ever find a dyslexic that there isn't some history somewhere back there the reading problem in the family. Okay, what is dyslexia? Hallelujah. Specific learning disability that is neurological in origin. It has its roots in the very brain systems that allow us to understand and express language. So when that's not in place, and a student's starting to struggle with this, their self-esteem drops immediately. And that's one of the most difficult, I think, um, all characteristics of a dyslexic to, to work with is that self-esteem. I know that as librarians you probably came with, well give me some tools, give me some books, let me know where I can go to get some things to help alleviate some of the problems for these kids. And I have some of those for you, but what I want you to remember from me when you go out today is build self-esteem. Think of every creative way that you can to connect with kids, and I'll have a slide that actually says make connections coming up here. To connect with kids, to get to know kids, maybe not all of them, but like does it take one or two at a time? Connect with those kids, get to know their interests so that you can build self-esteem because these kids are also very, very gifted kids with wonderful interests that as librarians you can uh, minister to and, that, and you can support. All right, it's characterized by difficulties with accurate or fluent word recognition, always. Poor decoding skills, always. Poor writing and poor spelling as well. The difficulties typically result from deficit in the phonological component of language 
that is often unexpected related to other cognitive abilities and the provision of effective classroom instruction. Again, if you have a motivated kid, you come from an environment where language and reading is, is pretty much valued, uh, you think my student or my child is going to be a good student too, or just like my neighbor's kids. All right? So let me go back to this right here. Um, Phonological component like the language system is built like this. If you think of Legos, like a, a little tower of Legos, the first Lego is called phonology. Okay, the second one would be uh, semantics, word meaning and understanding, vocabulary and word meaning. The third Lego would be syntax, grammar, how all that fits grammatically in those sense. Then the last one, discourse. Okay, that's how sentences connect together. The last three, semantics, syntax, and discourse. Those three equal comprehension. But none of those can happen if this first building block, the foundation, we all know how important the foundation is to a building. If that's not there, your building's going to crumble, right? It just doesn't stand. That foundation, that phonological component, is missing in a dyslexic. So when they look at letters like ca, at, like the, the letters cat, what other people, typical learners, learn that quite quickly, and as they're reading and they see words like cat, nut, is, and and, and all the other words that we can read quite easily, because we have those now in our word bank, in that part of our brain that stores and, and uh, those words as memory, along with all of our phonology and all of our phonetic instruction and experience, we can retrieve those words quite quickly. But even an adult dyslexic, when they look at those, it's like looking at, remember the old wood, you're not, some of you, are not old enough to remember this, but there were wooden blocks with the letters on them. And if you sort of erase those letters or they got real worn down, you had to look really close to see what those are. It's kind of like that for dyslexic. Or one time I had someone describe it this way. A little boy got a pair of glasses and he'd been looking at a brick wall. He got a pair of glasses and as soon as he put them on, he said, oh my goodness, look at this is all said that it made it a brick. I thought it was one big red smudge. And that's what a dyslexic might see when they look at a word. They might see a smudge of things, and they're trying to decipher what they mean. So they see these squiggly marks on a page, like C, A, and T. Okay, they are just graphics. All language in any country, anywhere, is a code system that has to be broken. They're all graphics, and you have got to attach meaning and sound to those graphics in order to speak, in order to communicate, and certainly in order to read. So what would come fairly easy to a typical learner the dyslexic has to pick that letter up in their mind, and they have to first say, okay, what's this squiggle mark mean? Oh, that's, that's a C, that's right, C, C. And what, what is that sound? Okay, it's a cup, 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 okay? And then they look at the A, they look at the T, and they go through that same methodical. So it takes energy. We can image brains now, and we can see the energy at work as you're thinking and even imagining. Boy, have we come far in technology, we really have. And they can see the activity in a brain. We can see all this activity going on both sides of the brain, particularly in the left side of the brain, with typical readers, and then in dyslexic, this, this side of the brain, this left side of the brain, if I were to draw a brain like this on a screen, okay, you're looking at the left side of my brain, we have three main areas here and one behind the area, this is where phonology, or phonology takes place and all the phonological issues take place and that's what's missing in a dyslexic. We have brain images where there just isn't anything there. And um, fortunately, through the programs that we teach, we can train those neural circuits from the right side to come over to the left. We're actually seeing the images begin to appear over here. So that just thrills me because I know I can see with the students in front of me, but we actually have imaging that shows the results of my work and your work too. So uh, let's see, where was I with this? Okay, so this dyslexic is picking up all of these sounds, putting them together, then they have to arrange them. Okay, they got the cut, they got the a, and they got the t. They may be in a different position in their brain. They have to order them. Now they have to put that together, give it meaning, and now produce it out of their mouth. And I will very often see some of my emergent readers and some of my younger students or some of the earlier, not even always the younger ones, but younger to my therapy, the type of reading therapy that I use, I will see them know what they want to say. But they might be going like this. Act, 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 act. 
and we use fingers to help slide across. I remember the days when we would tell kids not to use your fingers, try and trap with your eyes. Well, that's a good muscle development. For other things, for a dyslexic, they should be using their fingers or a pencil or one of those little wands. I have the wooden wands of stars and I let my little kids, you know, because they love to read the stars, you know, but track in some way so that they can help get those sounds out. A multi-sensory approach is the way these kids learn to read. So anytime you're using vision, hearing, and some sort of kinesthetic, their hand tapping the sounds out, segmenting the sounds on their fingers. This is all a, a, a normal, everyday part of every lesson that I teach. Every single lesson that I teach is multi-sensory because that's the way they learn to read. And it's with practice again and again and again, practice over and over and over again, that those neural circuits are developed and that memory can be stored for retrieval at a later date. So reading books over and over and over again, as opposed to saying, well, we already read that book. No, let these children read books over and over and over again, especially at the younger age, they can get a psychocabulary book too. And, and the flow of the language, and they can hear the cadence. I'll talk a little bit about what you or what you can suggest to parents to help children at home with that. Okay, strengths of kids with dyslexia. We now have more research, and this is sound research. We have people on dyslexic boards all across the country talking about this in, in conferences now. These kids are also born wired on the right side of the brain with a giftedness. Just like I said, Charles Schwab can do math way better than I can, and I am not dyslexic in math, all right? Dyslexic is, and as far as I know. Although the more I teach this, I keep thinking maybe I'm dyslexic. You know, because we all have strengths and weaknesses, every one of us. But um, they are extremely curious. They have great imaginations. They, they're, they are the great getting the big picture, the gist of things. These kids get the gist of things quickly. They have surprising maturity for their age, large vocabularies. Okay, they could be bubbly as all get out with a huge vocabulary and, you know, the center of attraction wherever they go, not in an overt way, not overly dumb, but just not a kid that you would look at and think, boy, they've got a strong, significant learning disability. Um, large vocabulary for age, again, enjoyment in solving puzzles, excellent comprehension of stories that are read to them. Excels at art, music, dance, drama, sports, and public speaking. So the new research set out, that, that's out now, is that on the right side of the brain, they are also hardwired during the same fetal stages that this phonological component is missing. They are hardwired for giftedness. The glitch is this. By the time a kid goes through school, and he's developed all those years of poor self-esteem, thinking they're broken, thinking there's something wrong with them. Maybe their brain is smaller than other kids' brains. All my friends can do things I can't do. Kids live in the now. It's hard for them to know that when they become an adult, they're probably going to excel. You know, we're all driven just like you are when I was teaching. You would, we're all teachers together. Today, I, I consider us all kind of wearing the same hat. You just know some things I don't. You have experiences that I haven't had. Maybe I've had a few that you haven't had. Together, we can share those things. But at any rate, these kids need that self-esteem build first and foremost. And you can't stop doing that. So as a librarian, I'm going to get ahead of myself, but I want to make sure that I get this in. As librarians, if you can get to know your kids, pick a couple, get to know them, and build the self esteem. Find out what their interests are, because they have, they, they're going to excel at something, all right? Find out what these interests are, develop programs around those interests. I will have a slide coming up in a moment on that. But get to know these kids and build their self esteem. Now, let's pretend like I'm a dyslexic. And my mom says, oh, you've got this, this paper coming up, you've got this, um, this, um, this project on Abraham Lincoln, we better go and do some research. <gasps> Without thought of research, I immediately think books, reading, all those words on a page, oh my gosh, you know. And, I don't, and then she drives the library and I look and here's a building that's usually you know, more than one story high. And I think it's all full of books. It all represents that which frustrates me and makes me feel but if their first thought about coming to the library is you, and you make it so much easier for them, when they say go to the library, they're not going to think about it with books. They're going to think about your face. And they're going to think about Miss or Mrs. or Mr. Somebody that always makes this sweet. I'll just go find them. And they'll help me find my books, and they'll help me 
get through my research in the, the easiest way for me. For a dyslexic, the easiest way to read is with the ear. There are three ways to read. We read with our fingers, blind people braille. We read with our eyes, <coughs> a typical reader, typical learner. And we read with our ears. And there's nothing wrong with reading with your ears. That's one form of reading, okay? So, we'll move on and I'll get to other things that librarians can do. But build self-esteem. Work your best at becoming the face that they love to see because you're going to help them with everything. You're going to help them find that book, even if they know how to use a card catalog or the computer in the library to find a resource book or some resource materials. They may get to that to that uh, row of books and all of a sudden it all starts to warm them. So walk with them, help them find the book, get a couple of books, open them up. You know, there are, there are ways of checking a kid's readability level. Uh, I'll get into that, and I do have a handout for that for you too, a, a little later. But um, be as big a help as you can, and I'm not going to talk more on that until we get through some of these slides, because I want to open up what you ask questions too. Okay, where are we here? Okay. Blending sounds into words, dog. If they can't segment and they and they 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 don't understand the relationship that each of those sounds represent, or each of those letters represent a sound. When you put sounds together, they become words. And they can't the readers, they can't take those sounds apart. Then they're not going to be able to read. Dif confusion of sound sequences formed from difficulty in hearing different segments of a word. Tiger and tiger. Very often, as I'm reading with kids, even older kids, are going to leave that last syllable off. Forget simple words from one page to the next. Parents are so frustrated reading very, very simple books with kids for the same name. The cat's name is Tab, and they've seen it six times, and they still can't remember Tab. And they have the same difficulty in sounding out, trying to sound out Tab, because they just don't have that present in their memory. You have to, you have to create those neurons for them, or those neural passages for them. Okay, when reading aloud, they may pronounce the first letter sound and then make up the rest, which of course changes all the meaning, and it's very frustrating. I know for teachers in school, they don't know how to get it fit through the information because as they read, they're making up the second half and the third half of the word, a multi-syllable word, or even a single-syllable word, and giving it a completely different meaning. Then they insertion and deletion of letters when writing. More red flags for dyslexia. Like Difficulty with letters that have similar sounds. And V, K for G, T for D, and P for B. And if you think about it, all the first letter on this side of the slash, on the left side of the slash mark, those are all the unvoiced sound for the same letter on the right side. So, with voice becomes, with voice becomes, with voice becomes, and with voice becomes, you have no idea the automaticity of what you do in your brain compared to what a dyslexic has to do with. Because it all has to be done remotely, systematically, and intentionally with an awful lot of energy. I've seen a six-year-old work with me so hard to try to put together sounds that I was watching her big blue eyes. I saw all the veins in her eyes begin just to pop like red, like bloodshot. It was just too much for her. Just too much to even approach that part of the lesson. So I terminated that part of the lesson and we went up to whiteboard and we did some other things with manipulative and magnetic colors. Okay. <clears throat> Difficulty with sequencing days of the week and months of the year. Difficulty with self-expression, both verbal and written. Difficulty rhyming words. They don't enjoy reading at all. Again, family history and the performance, again, doesn't match their intellectual potential. Okay. Treatment options. Reading replacement programs incorporating a multi-sensory direct instruction approach on reading. Horton Gillingham is what I teach. It's the first one. It's highly structured, it's systematic, diagnostic, and engages all the senses, or at least the main three senses. Those three senses are the three pathways of the brain, kinesthetic, visual, and auditory. So every lesson incorporates those senses. Uh, it's prescriptive in nature. I'm constantly taking notes on my kids, and I'm constantly monitoring where they are so that I can plan for the next session. So it's designed one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. Orton and Gillingham, and I have a handout for all of you right here. I'm going to pass. Oh, okay, great. And on the back are some library kids, but we'll, I'm going to roll those together with you too. Okay, great, thanks. Yes, 
So I didn't have to take up too much of your time talking about that. These are the main components of what I teach. Okay, there are, there are others in addition to these. These are some of the more common ones in our area here that are taught. Slant and Wilson. They also incorporate a multi-sensory form of teaching reading, but they're designed through groups. Uh, Slant can be taught one-on-one. -on -one. Wilson is usually in the schools with small groups, and Wilson is often used. I think some of our kindergarten and first grade use Wilson, some of the Wilson products right here in Glenview to teach letters and letter sounds. Will, Mary Wilson took her training from Orton Dillingham, which has been around since the 1800s. And it's proven, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's science research based, and it has never changed. It helps kids to read. Now, as a classroom teacher, I might look at this and say, oh, this is so stringent, it's, it's so bare bones, it's, there's no creativity. When you have a kid who's dyslexic or who has not been able to learn reading the typical way, you need to bare bones it. You need to teach these kids how to read, and this will do it. I've never had a child, I've never had a child yet that's come to me with a dyslexic diagnosis or otherwise that I could not help to read this way by accessing all three pathways to the brain. That's why I kind of jump school system to help kids out. I can see that I'm making a difference and that, you know, that I guess feeds me professionally to know that I'm really making a difference in a kid's life and then eventually or systematically in the whole family's life once children learn to read and they're so happy with themselves. And we celebrate at the end of level. I take them for ice cream. My older kids I take for a burger. I mean they're just so happy, they feel so confident, so good about themselves. And or Gillingham is structured so that kids do have success every time they come out of a lesson. Anytime I introduce a sound or a sound pattern or a rule, we introduce a review six lessons back. So when I introduce a new one, I drop off that seventh one on the end and I review this six. We, we, we teach this, we review this, and I add another one, I drop the one off the end, and I'm reviewing the previous six. So there's that constant repetition to keep making those neural pathways from the right side over to the left side of the brain for memory and for usage. Uh, so Mary Wilson took her instruction from Morton Gillingham, changed it up just enough that it could be used with small groups of children. I've often been asked, well, my kid gets posted in school, how come they're still not learning to read? I don't have answers for that, but I have suspicion because I've been in the school system and I've used Wilson. And I've also done full programs for ESL where I was using Wilson. And it will work. But here's the, the catch, I think. Most of these kids are screened to get maybe 30 minutes of support help a few times a week. Well, first of all, I know as a teacher, I go over to this classroom and I get this little kid and I hop in the door and she's just finishing something up, so I get these two from this classroom. And I go across the hall and I get a couple more from this classroom. And they're taking their snack because it's during snack time. Now they drop their snacks. We're going to clean up their oranges before we go on. By the time you get all your kid and you sit down, you've lost some minutes. All right? Then you sit down. There's always going to be one who's kicking somebody else or a bell or two little girls that had a snip in the morning. You know, that morning they lost. And you're settling all these kinds of things down. By the time you actually have instructional minutes, they're so reduced, it's just not enough time to make a difference. Plain and simple. If I had these kids every day for an hour, even four times a week, and then you look at the school schedules, how many days off we have, you know, how many days that, that are canceled or there's a school assembly, it's always going to be those little pull-outs that are going to have to, you know, bite the bullet on uh, school schedules. So they just, I don't think, get enough of them. If they got true, clean, unadulterated, you know, teachers not trying to make it fancy and fix it all up, which I would be the first one to want to do that. This could be taught, but I just don't think there's enough of it. And it's a support program, it's not reading replacement. So these kids need a reading replacement program, and they need it strong and hard, and the earlier the better. Okay, and then there are schools designed specifically for the education of dyslexic children. They're, very, they're usually a transitional school, they'll take them in for maybe three years, some longer. They can be maybe a K-8 school, but we have a school right around here, Hyde, which takes kids in transitionally for about three years, teaches them to read, and gets them out again. Focuses on dyslexia. You have to have a diagnosis of dyslexia to go into that school. Interventions and accommodations. Early identification. Dyslexia is identifiable with 92% accuracy by age 5.5. We know that the brain is more plastic and more malleable in young children and therefore easier to make those neural transfer, transfers. When I talk about the groups, the picture I always get in my, in my brain visually is when we lived in Michigan, we lived out in the country. And so we would get, you know, from my top floor window, I look out and there were some uh, farms and fields uh, to one side of the house, and there was, we had a pond, we had water around the pond, and deer would come and drink from that pond all the time. 
Well, in the spring, when all those lava weeds are shot up like this, you can only see them moving like this as the deer pass through. But as the summer wore on, those, those weeds were becoming more and more worn down to where they didn't even exist. There was nothing but a dirt path to where those deer went every single day to drink from that pond, and every single day the same way back to wherever they were in the woods. And I think of that, making those groups, it starts, it starts simple. It starts with, with a whole lot of effort on your part and certainly on the student's part. But we make those grooves. We make those transfers. We make those neural pathways from the right side to the left side. And they do become skilled readers. That's the great thing. Does a learning disability ever go away? Never. Do they ever catch up? Rarely. They're not fast readers, but they're accurate readers. So that's what we go for. Accuracy. Okay. Reading replacement programs, which is taught with smaller group size, quieter rooms. I have an earplug option here. At home, that might be a good option for a student that's trying to study with all the distractions around their home. I thought it may be possible that once you know your students, you even have a set of earplugs so that if there's an area where they're studying or they want to read or they're trying to, to um, comprehend information, they can come to you and you give them some earplugs. I think earplugs are fairly inexpensive. Maybe you can even get some company to donate so many to you. Now, I know the problems of those who create for classroom teachers. You can have earplugs all over. Everybody else and their brother and sister thinks it'd be fun to have earplugs to play with in the library. So this is going to take some discretion. But we want to look at every option first, what can help a kid, and then think about how we can monitor it so that it doesn't become an issue in our environment. Okay, reduce homework assignments. Absolutely. There's no reason why a child, even with dyscalculia, who can't do or has a difficult time doing problems on a page, there's no reason why they can't do the first two rows and skip the last six rows. What you want to know is does a child understand the concept. So same with reading. Reading assignments can be reduced. Notes can be given ahead of time to students. And print can be enlarged. That's a biggie that I'm going to talk about in just a moment here. Extra time for tests. Reports, reading, and writing assignments. This should be written right into IEPs. Once again, if you can tell parents, you know, as a parent's talking to you and they're looking for ideas or helps, you might say, you know what? We had a speaker here. I, I've never met the woman she's talking about, but I know they have an advocate at school that you can just call. It's not going to cost you. Just call and ask her about some of this. You know, or say, well, and you can ask them here, well, do they have an IEP? Because this should be written right into the IEP that they have extra time for tests. Maybe a separate room where they take the tests. Okay, all the features of the word are not properly integrated in a dyslexic's mind. So people must rely on dyslexic, people must rely on other brain systems, other brain systems, to figure out a word manually to get us meaning. When I said it's laborious and systematic, it's like a manual shift in a car. Did you ever drive a car? Again, I'm looking at people that I know are so much younger than me, you could never have had this experience. Most of you, I think, are younger than I am. But at any rate, did you ever drive a car and all of a sudden that steering went out and you had to, you had to steer without that automatic, I don't know, fluid or whatever they put into a steering wheel? It is laborious. And you wonder if you're going to get your car back in the right lane before you can get it off to the side of the road and figure out what happened. Or brakes or anything like that. It's manual. It takes a lot of energy for these kids and these people, even as adults, to put these words together. But it does get easier, I can tell you, it does get easier. Okay, interventions and accommodations, separate them for exams again, test questions read aloud to them, to make sure that they're reading correctly. Even if they're given more time, if they're not reading the test question correctly, they could answer it incorrectly because they have not the right order of words or they, they misread a word. So it's very important that test questions be read aloud to them. Parents can help with homework by reading the homework aloud to them, making sure that they understand what's being expected of them when they return to school the next day. Digital books and books on tape. Okay. I said if there was one thing I wanted you to walk away with, it was the whole issue of self-esteem, making connections, building connections with kids. The second one is digital books and books on tape. Connect with technology and find every book that you can find on tape. I'll talk a little bit more about that and give you an idea of a great place that you can go to get textbooks on tape so that you can tap into your schools before school starts, get a list of all the textbooks that are going to be used, and then order those textbooks 
from this company. They can do. They have thousands, hundreds of thousands of books already out there, textbooks already printed digitally for you. But they can reproduce one very, very quickly, get it to you too. It's one of the schools for the blind, and I have that information in the handbook in this book. Um, so partial waiver from foreign language classes. Some of my kids are fairly successful. They're highly motivated. They may be kids with a different level of dyslexia. But when I say powerful we were from foreign language classes, it would be if they were to select a foreign language class in sixth grade, which I believe most of the schoolers have to take a foreign language class, maybe as opposed to the language itself, they have standards where they have to learn about culture. And I don't mean just, you know, this is what they eat and this is what they produce. I mean real in-depth study of culture. Because these kids are bright kids, and they want to learn, and they've got the fascination to learn. And they are always learning, but just not the way a typical reader learns to read. So a partial reader might include asking the school if they can have uh, a waiver to produce culture, and then work with the teacher to write a good lesson plan or to write down some good goals uh, to study the culture of that man. Okay, and then type, of course, type versus written reports. Okay, how libraries can help, ta-da, which we've been waiting for, right? Okay, make connections, build that rapport, get to know your kids, let your face be the one that they want to come to. When they think of library, they don't think of that big building with what makes me frustrated. They do not. What they're thinking about is you and how easy, how much easier you make their life because of the, the, the types of support that you supply for them. And just your genuine smile and interest in them. Find out what interests them. If they like pirates, get books on pirates. If they like space, get books on space. We know second graders, first graders like dolphins and water animals. Get all that you can on those animals. Okay, for younger ones, okay, oh, digital books, books on tape, CD run. Okay, rhyming books for the younger ones, controlled readers. I have Bob books up here, just www.bob books, because they're an easy controlled reader that I've even seen them in sets at Costco. Parents can pick them up, you can get them, and again, read them over and over and over and over and over again. That's something that parents can do. Lexile Framework tells the books readability level, and there's uh, uh, a website up here for that. The Lexile level has hundreds of thousands of books, and so does Scholastic. Almost every Scholastic book has a Lexile level. Many other books now are also have a Lexile level, but you can tap into this, this website you can give any title of the book, and it'll give you what's called a lexile level. And that's a range of readability based on sentence length and vocabulary. So once a child, and you can ask the child, you know, go back, ask your teacher what your lexile level is, bring it to me on a sticky note, and then we'll find books in that level. Because we know those will be good ones for you to read. Okay, and then summer reading program accommodations. Uh, I know you have summer reading programs. I have a student that is from another library, a ways away from here that I teach, and his mom brought him in for summer reading program. He's in one of my last levels now. He's doing quite well, but still, it's not a great level. And so when he went in, all the books there were really difficult books for him. And uh, he asked if he could pick some books, or the library could help pick some books, and I'm sure it was probably one of the kids that were trained by the library to help these kids out said, are you sure you're just not wanting to read easy books so that you can get the prize faster? Oh, that was such an embarrassing go back. I didn't want to be a part of the summer reading program because I just reminded him of his inadequacies. So I would say, maybe, I was trying to think this through, maybe on the form, with, on the registration form, when you know parents come in and they sign their kid up for that, or they're signed by the schools, or however that, that takes place in your libraries or in your communities, maybe you could have something on there that designates or indicates whether or not they have an IEP or a 504 plan or anything else going on. ESL students to say, students, anybody that's just going to learn the, the English language. And then select a number of books that they can read from so that they can be a part of this whole reading program. Okay, how I oh, and I went back with sentence. Something else that you might want to think about is adding other programs that accommodate and support their interests. You know, if they're interested in art, art programs, you know, drama and dyslexic, right there. All right. They're the ones that have hundreds and hundreds and, I mean, tens of thousands of books already, textbooks already in place. If a kid found out my library has my textbook 
on a digital form so that I can listen to it because I'm an ear reader and maybe I can listen as I'm going along on my page. What a help that would be. Okay, now magnification machines and devices. The Chicago Lighthouse, I've, I've cited them quite often up here. They have all kinds of really neat magnification devices and they're affordable. A couple of them are like a couple thousand dollars, $2,800 for a library in your community and anybody that I don't know what kind of support that you can get from a community, but let's say that you had a set of even two or three of these. Anybody with any kind of visual issues can put a book down. I visited this place. It was just a, a, a magnificent, uh, I guess, gold mine to me. But it's almost like a dot camera in that you can just place a book down. It's so easy. A kid can dial like this and magnify that print to any size they want to on the screen. They can change the font, they can change the background color, and in addition to these, they have some handheld devices. Of course, you know, you're not going to have a beeper or something on those because just like iPads, they can disappear, I understand. But they have a handheld device where a kid can, can scan across a page. But these are wonderful. And the Chicago Lighthouse has a, an office right here in Waukegan Road, straight down Waukegan Road, just a stone's throw from where you are. And they're so accommodating. If you just stop in there, and people that are outside the area can just write down Chicago Lighthouse, find out where, I know they have an office downtown Chicago, but they have one right here, and they can introduce you to some of these magnifying readers. I grabbed a couple of the handouts, and I'm just going to pass these around the table so you can kind of take a, a look at where they look just like a computer screen. But they're so versatile. And then, of course, you get into <coughs> speech, to di speech to text dictation programs, software from there, and other places. I know even Apple computers and Macs now have built in software. You can get text to speech right to you. But there are other devices out there that will read a web page to you. There are devices out there that will sound out a word, spell a word, segment a word. There's something called a reading pen out there now with a little screen on it where kids can scan across a page and it will highlight words, it will, it will read to you, it will spell the words, um, and just a whole lot of nifty things. So just look up the dyslexic reading pen. But I, when I was there and I saw some of these devices that I thought you could, you, you know, it's pretty hard to pick up and carry out, you know, something that's almost as big as a computer, but I mean, just wonderful devices for magnifying the print. One thing that will really turn off and create great fear and anxiety in dyslexic readers when they open up when they see all those pages or they see how thick a book is. You know, in first and second grade, everybody wants to read a chapter book. That is just so fancy schmancy to learn to read a chapter book. And I have an old series by Penny Platt called Big Boy. You can't even buy them anymore. I found one in London for $75. The ones I have that I taught with many, many years ago that have a control vocabulary that they're a little thicker and they have bold headings. So some of my first and second graders think that they're reading a chapter book. And it's a great way to, for me, to uh, improve site vocabulary and also build self-esteem. Okay, so I'm saying invest in technology. That's who kids are today. So you're already tapping into something they like, something they can refer to, something that they can um, relate to. So reading text aloud, page readers, e-readers, reads web pages, there's just so much out there. I couldn't begin to list it all. I thought I'd take too much of our time if I did it. I can just tell you, go here and go to the reading for the book. Take a couple of things and see what you can do with that. Because I can always come back or I can always send you more information if you exhaust some of these. Okay, okay program editions again. Add opportunity for the exploration of other interests. And this could be your summer programs as well. Art programs, photography programs, drama programs, equipment the studio for video recording. All of these are very typical areas where a young dyslexic is going to excel. One of the handouts that I have that you have right now talks about Hamlet. Teachers teach Hamlet. Shakespeare's Hamlet. Shakespeare's Hamlet. It's just in the middle of a paragraph, but I'll just tell you what's there. You can read the whole thing later and just save time here. But Shakespeare's Hamlet is written probably on a lower level than the sports page in the newspaper. But kids will read the sports page in the newspaper 
well, adequately than they would in Canada because they don't have the life experiences, they don't have um, they don't have a connection with the language that's used in Hamlet, but they know what the technology or the technical names rather are for many of the sports um, references. They know the names, they know what the numbers and the scores mean, and they can actually get through material at a higher level because of that interest level. So if you can tap into their interest through summer programs or through getting more folks at their level or in their in, at their interest level and then reproducing those somehow digitally or magnification. Magnification machines are great because as I said, you can even get used ones less expensive that aren't the, the latest one off the market. I can even sell them up there at the Chicago Lighthouse. And they're great machines. It's like getting a car with full warranty, a used car with full warranty. And that would you know, eliminate the, uh, the necessity for having everything in the library on digital tape or on magnification because they can magnify it themselves. So sometimes then they can read that magnification as they're also listening. They can follow along. There are some programs that highlight language and follow along. I didn't put them in here because they're more appropriate for schools. Kids have to use them pretty much every day and they have to be monitored. They're wonderful because they will monitor your reading level, they'll highlight words as you're reading along to but they're more for school practice. If you had them in the library, your kids would have to be coming in every day and keeping scores and records of their progress. And that's just not what you're about. Okay, program additions again. When possible, order to or create posters and friendlier fonts. Some of the friendlier fonts are Arial, Helvetica, and Libri. No, dyslexia is a font with weighted bottoms. Um, they're, they're darker, they're heavier. The D kind of leans to one side and has a really dark, heavy bottom. But in the end, all the research shows that that's not going to improve fluency. There aren't a whole lot of books written in dyslexia anyhow. So I would say your rule of thumb should be just keep it simple, keep it clear, and well-spaced. Sometimes the spacing between lines is more important than the size of the letters. So keep it spaced well, all right? Now is my thank you. All of our convenient services, neuropsychology and texting. Let me say this, the only way you really know if your child is dyslexic is with a neuropsychological report. They can tell us that they would have to be so off the charge with reverses of all her letters and but in school. There's such a small percentage that actually have that reversal of letters, that mirror imaging. Some dyslexic do, it's a very small percentage of dyslexics that do. About 85% of all IEPs in school are probably dyslexic. Uh, dyslexia affects maybe 30, 20 to 30 percent of all of our population. Somewhere in this group, we are probably dyslexic. We may know it, we may not. Okay. And look how bright we are, right? <laughs> Always learning, go getters. Okay. Applied behavior analysis, occupational therapy, academic specialist, that would be me, speech therapy, physical therapy, social work. We now have several um, facilities offices that you can go to, Lake Bluff just opened a couple of weeks ago. My cards are on the back table along with some handouts for you, but my cards only list, I think, two or three of the, of the locations because my cards are older and I need the cards, I just blend some, but I want you to know that we have them. And you can go to the, to the general website or just call this general phone number right here and they'll connect you with the office that's closest to you. Alrighty? And now, My name is Melinda Bush, politician of sorts. Who would the governor, I'm going to give you all one of these just so that you know. I don't know where we are with this, but they did pass a law saying that all schools are going to now have to train teachers in some form of multi-sensory education because of dyslexics. I don't know where this is, but I'm going to meet with Melinda Bush. I'm going to find out where this is and see if I can't help ram on this in so that we can get teachers trained. Now they may say, oh yeah, teachers are trained in Wilson. But we have to let teachers know that's not enough. You know, if they're trained in Wilson, it has to be a good, clear-cut program. Don't shorten it, don't cut it because of the minutes. They have to have 